What's up, YouTube? Natural Hypertrophy just put up a very good video where he addressed pushback against hypertrophy training, but also acknowledged that there are some very good reasons for why hypertrophy training has been a target for criticism recently. And I wanted to weigh in on this because the interplay of hypertrophy and functional training is one of my main focuses. Um, in fact, he echoed a lot of the points that I made in my recent Instagram essay, How Muscle Built Are True in Bodybuilding. Uh, I know a lot of you guys don't read those, but they're actually surprisingly successful on Instagram. A lot of people really like them, so I try to you know, spread my content here and there. But anyway, it explains how the combination of unhealthy dysfunctionality of modern mass monster pro bodybuilding combines with anti-function rhetoric from some hypertrophy purists to give all the other fitness clicks an excuse to avoid hypertrophy training and do a bunch of DYL nonsense instead. And it also gaslights bodybuilders into avoiding types of training that would actually help with their bodybuilding as well as just make their exercise more functional. So I do have a couple of quibbles with what NH said, but I'll try to get those out of the way quickly and then build on both his points from the video and my own and make some really simple, concrete, low-hanging fruit suggestions on how modern bodybuilding and hypertrophy training can become much more functional while enhancing or at the very minimum not impairing hypertrophy results. Because I think that's what's missing from this debate. The fact that it really wouldn't take much to really make bodybuilding training much more unambiguously functional. So real quick, let's just look at his intro. Hey YouTube, you might have noticed that there's a lot of pushback against bodybuilding training nowadays. People who train purely for hypertrophy seem to have gained this reputation of being small science nerds who neurotically obsess over optimal training. And when you compare that to the much cooler methods of strength athletes, for example, who just horse weight around with complete and total disregard for muscle growth, or the hybrid athletes who can move their bodies in tons of fun ways, it does seem that bodybuilding now looks cringe and lame in comparison. And as someone whose name is Natural Hypertrophy, this is not something that I enjoy seeing. But I must admit that the critics have a point. It does seem that bodybuilding training has lost its way. And so if you want more people to get into natural bodybuilding, it's our responsibility as those who train purely for hypertrophy to understand exactly why what happened to get to that point. And it's exactly what I want to do in this video. I'm going to try and figure out what exactly made hypertrophy training so lame in the first place, which should logically also lead us to a discussion of what constitutes effective bodybuilding training. So what I don't get is why someone whose name is Natural Hypertrophy, who's usually the raging attack dog of natural bodybuilders, isn't taking the opportunity to put the blame for this where it belongs on steroid abuse. Maybe he's thinking about this purely in the context of natural lifting, and that's a nice thing to be able to do. There actually is enough of a natural community now that you can kind of do that. But the reality is in the broader fitness space, the vast majority of the damage done to the reputation of hypertrophy training and pure bodybuilding has been done by enhanced bodybuilders taking wild cycles of God knows what. As a scapegoat and say, oh, whatever I'm doing right now that looks like I'm a monkey on crack is actually great because that way you won't end up like a bodybuilder. You won't end up with use less muscles, like I've seen some people say, use less muscle, a muscle is a muscle. If you train it through a function, it will fulfill that function. It starts and ends there. Ren nah, dude, there is totally such a thing as dysfunctional muscle. These mass monsters are pulling their muscles off the tendon all the time on silly little exercises. We're seeing, you know, pec tears, just all sorts of stuff. Even on isolation exercises, we're seeing, you know, crazy injuries that just should not be happening. And that's a you know, a huge part of why modern hypertrophy training emphasizes the safe exercises, you know, stimulus to fatigue ratio. It's just because mass monster steroid muscle is dysfunctional. You know, a muscle is not functional if you can't use it safely without it ripping off the bone. It's not that the muscle is dysfunctional. It's that, you know, the rest of the structure can't support it. And that, unfortunately, is a consequence of using you know, excessive steroids. And God knows what else these people are on to build just massive amounts of muscle beyond what the frame could ever possibly handle. That is dysfunctional. You know, you and I think a lot of people are starting to realize now that these giant rotted up bodybuilders really can't do that much with their muscle safely without getting injured or stroking out or having a heart attack and so on, you know? I mean, these people are dropping dead at, you know, in their 30s, even their 20s. So, hell, I mean, even if you're dropping dead in your 50s or late 40s, that, that shouldn't be the case. You shouldn't be having heart attacks and dying at that age, you know, especially not if you're a healthy fitness enthusiast, let alone in your 20s, which is happening all too often, right? Um... So it's it, it's very clear that some of this actually is, in fact, legitimately dysfunctional. And that provides a great excuse for a lot of other 
clicks in fitness to avoid hypertrophy training. Now, you know, the I, I don't care at all about function. I only care about hypertrophy, ideological purity spiraling from people like natural hypertrophy. Uh, you know, it probably played some role in the reputational damage to training for hypertrophy, but I think it's fairly minor. I mean, let's be real. A lot of folks don't even know that natural bodybuilding exists, but a ton of people now are very aware of the fact that, you know, mass monster level bodybuilders are not actually functional, right? So I think, well, you know, it's it's cool for NH to try to, you know, perhaps have natural bodybuilders take a little bit of ownership for the fact that hypertrophy training has gotten a bad rap. I think that's kind of a drop in the bucket compared to the damage that the enhanced mass monsters have done to it. Now, there's one more little thing that I take issue with real quick. I know that this argument of certain movements being simply better than others for muscle growth is often rejected by people who counter it by saying that the Bronze Era bodybuilders also happen to be strongmen and that their training for the two practices didn't differ that much. And these people have a point, but they have to keep in mind that what they're discussing took place 100 years ago. We are now in the future. And isn't the entire point of the fitness industry to evolve the methods? I think that if we were all still training exactly the same way we were 100 years ago, it would just mean that we failed. We failed at the one thing we were supposed to do, which is to advance the game. I would also think that our glorious ancestors, the strongmen of old, would be highly disappointed to see that we did nothing but twiddle our thumb for 100 years. The cerebral and technological advancement of lifting is directly responsible for the better physiques and the higher strengths that we see nowadays. Because yes, we are stronger and bigger than we used to be without drugs. Okay, I'm talking about the natural community here. And so, so I don't think anyone looking at it objectively would say that the Bronze Era was the pinnacle of bodybuilding. Strength, yes, absolutely, in some ways, definitely. But if we're talking about pure natural bodybuilding, it would be the Silver Era, right? And if we're talking about Enhanced, it would be the Golden Era. What I don't think anyone would say is that it's the modern era of bodybuilding, right? While there were some great bodybuilders in the Bronze Era, definitely, it's clear that the field as a whole advanced through the mid-20th century. But it's also fairly clear that it declined into the 21st century. Now, there are definitely some natural bodybuilders today who are on par with or even surpass many of the Silver Era greats right now. That's absolutely true. But they also tend to be very critical of the contemporary training zeitgeist. And many of the very most impressive specimens from our era, like Bald Viking, Hersoviak, Alex Leonidas, explicitly train in a manner that's far more akin to the Silver Era than our own. They'll specifically tell you that they're using Silver Era techniques and you know, following Silver Era principles. So we should definitely be trying to advance the craft, innovate, make things better, right? We should not be trying to do historical reenactment. I totally agree, and the guys that I mentioned are innovators, and I try to do the same thing, but let's build on a solid foundation. I think the zeitgeist of the Silver Era is a much better foundation for natural bodybuilders to build on and innovate from than modern steroid-derived optimal training, and that's why the techniques that I experiment with and try to improve upon, or maybe not improve upon objectively, but try to find, you know, better ways for me to use them and maybe better ways for other people to use them than what you might see in historical books. That's why most of these techniques I'm you know, basing these on silver te techniques, right? Like I just posted an upright row variation to Instagram that I found a lot more usable than the traditional upright row, you know, but I, I tend to go to the silver era for inspiration for what I'm going to try to innovate with rather than, you know, modern optimal training. And I think in age increase with me based on this next statement here. To not be caught in the fitness zeitgeist of hype, we simply have to disregard this and look at the characteristics that define every single movement. And once you do that, you'll realize that every single movement that is now deemed good for hypertrophy all share the same characteristics. They're all hyperstable and they all focus on stimulus to fatigue ratio which explains why a lot of heavy compound movements are nowadays deemed bad for hypertrophy because they're too fatiguing. And they instead have been replaced by movements who give you maximal stimulus with minimal accessory fatigue. And this is exactly the problem with modern hypertrophy training because this approach, while effective and important, only works to a point. But if you take it too far, you end up with a caricature of what proper hypertrophy training should be. Yeah, I completely agree with this. But there's a dirty little secret behind this emphasis on risk reduction and stimulus to fatigue ratio that's found in what's now known as optimal training. Something can't just be optimal in the abstract, that doesn't mean anything. It has to be optimal for a particular purpose, right? 
So what is optimal training optimal for? Hypertrophy, right? Well, okay, but that's not specific enough. The part they don't tell you is the population. And the population is, number one, participants in studies, which means unserious beginners, because no serious lifter would stop their own training to participate in some study, right? But secondly, that population is steroid users who are at much more risk of injury and also don't need nearly as much stimulus to grow and thus benefit from safe, easy exercises. Keep that information in mind. It'll come in handy in a bit as I get to the point of this video, which is to propose some low-hanging fruit to make hypertrophy training more functional for naturals. So this part is going to be building off what NH said in this video. As you'll see, if you've watched it, he already touched on a lot of what I have to say, and he's even anticipating some of the suggestions that I'm about to make. But I want to build on his points in my own and make some concrete recommendations as to how to make hypertrophy training into something that no one can look at and say that's not functional, unless they're, you know, a bunch of crazy delusional DYLs like the functional patterns guys, right? Natty Aguilar and all that. Obviously, we're, the goal here is not just to not get criticized. The goal is more to actually have healthy, functional bodies that are good for stuff and all, but, you know, addressing the criticism is part of that, right? Anyway, you guys get where I'm coming from. My first suggestion is to train loaded flexion. I'm sure a lot of you guys expected that, and of course I'm saying that. This is the lowest of low-hanging fruit because this will 100% enhance hypertrophy as well as improving range of motion and resistance to injury in one of the areas that most commonly sidelines bodybuilders, athletes, regular people from all walks of life, right? The low back. Low back injuries are incredibly common, right? Bodybuilders tend not to care as much about spinal erectors as other muscles, sure, but they look really cool and well-developed. This is also an area where with proper training, naturals can compare really favorably with enhanced athletes, especially those who train optimally for hypertrophy. I'm being sarcastic there. Uh, very few bodybuilders today compare favorably with the likes of John Grimek, and even I get happy when a lot of enhanced guys post their backs because, frankly, the comparison is a nice ego boost for me. So my general recommendation as to how to implement this is to simply substitute Zercher deadlifts for your conventionals or sumos. Conventional deadlifts, and especially sumo, aren't great for hypertrophy. So why not use a movement with way more range of motion and upper back stimulus? Just purely from a hypertrophy perspective, ZDLs are a major upgrade on those pulls from the floor. And if you don't see how they might have functional benefits, I think you're being deliberately obtuse. Don't just go there and do like, you know, a one rep max Zercher deadlift though. Not at all. Number one, make sure you can do them safely. Obviously, if you have any sort of spinal injury, get that checked out first. And as a rule of thumb, you should be able to hook your elbows under the bar comfortably before you push them with any intensity. So if you can't do that, you have to work on mobility first. For that, I recommend light Jefferson curls. Anyway, you shouldn't be doing one rep maxes for hypertrophy anyway, so don't do one rep max. Nah, Zercher deadlifts expecting hypertrophy, right? I mean, I recommend somewhere in the 5 to 15 rep range, just like any other hypertrophy movement, you'll get a better stimulus with less risk of injury. But aren't those dangerous? No, not any more than a conventional if you have the mobility for them. It's much it's much lighter and that compensates for the increased range. So just use an appropriate weight and you'll be fine. When in doubt, push the reps more so than the weight, right? Okay, moving on. The next thing you can do to make bodybuilding training more functional is simply to train deep knee angles. Knees Over Toes Guy has brought attention to the importance of training deep knee angles for injury prevention, athleticism, and, you know, definitely as a small as a father of small children, I can tell you firsthand that it's really awesome to have my knees getting better with age instead of worse. But this type of training can also be an awesome hypertrophy option. Consider the Sissy Squad, which Natural Hypertrophy mentioned in this video. You know, not only does it have a bunch of functional benefits, mobility, balance, foot training, all that good stuff. It also has more hypertrophy potential than a leg extension, for example, because it puts the rec fem under stretch from both ends, not just one, and it all it allows deeper knee angles than would be possible on a machine since the machine just physically gets in the way of your knee flexing, right? Obviously, you should not jump straight into these cold or you will absolutely jack your knees up. How to, how to actually get into sissy squats would be too long for this video. It would need its own video. Um, you can look in my book. Uh, which details exactly how to get into sissy squats safely, scale into them safely. I'm going to be putting this into my upcoming program, Parking Lot Bodybuilding. I'm, I'm going to have a great video on exactly how to scale into that, but I've also posted it on Instagram, so if you're willing to just look through, you can find the information on the internet for free. But TLDR just warm up really well and ease in really, really gently. All right, moving on. Another factor that we can do to make 
bodybuilding training way more functional is to train your abs with spinal extension. Now, natural hypertrophy is a big proponent of direct ab training, and I completely agree with him on this. His concern is more for aesthetics, just the appearance of abs. Mine is a little bit more functional. You know, everybody knows spinal flexion is a vector for injury, but spinal extension often gets slept on, and that can be equally dangerous for the unprepared spine, but it can also be equally safe for a prepared spine. And an easy way to get some training for that is, you know, to acclimate the spine to extension while also killing two birds with one stone and getting some hypertrophy training, some really good hypertrophy training, by the way. Uh, just look at CrossFit athletes if you don't believe me. They abs are amazing, and you'll see what I'm about to recommend. Anyway, it's simply to perform ab work that involves spinal extension. And the easiest way to do that, probably if you have a gym that has one, is the GHD setup. Remember how I said cross CrossFit athletes, amazing abs, and they also get spinal extension training. Now, if you don't have a GHD setup available, just do what I'm showing here. Cross bench setups, same basic idea. Now, when doing this, be extremely cautious and conservative from working in. Progress through range of motion very gradually. Don't push too hard at first. You got to be just as cautious about extension as with flexion, but you can't avoid it, right? So just get into it slowly, but eventually you can push yourself and you'll get great ab development as well as being a lot more resistant to injury. All right. So again, completely agreeing with natural hypertrophy, pullovers are another way that we can get a lot of functional benefit out of bodybuilding. Pullovers are arguably the best way to build the teres majors, and they also promote shoulder health, which is another one of the most common injuries that sidelines bodybuilders and other athletes, right? There's a reason that the silver era guys who we talked about earlier were able to get away with tons of heavy pressing, even behind the neck pressing, whereas we tend not to be able to do that today. You know, and they also had fantastic back details. So once again, we see a uh, you know, bang for your buck way of increasing both your functionality and your hypertrophy. They go together. Okay, side bending. This is, I think uh, natural hypertrophy would also agree with me that direct oblique training is underrated today in bodybuilding. I think what we disagree on is how to accomplish it. You know, standard side bends are good, but I think overhead side bending work such as windmills, bent press, or the side press that we saw in you know, Manuel Pescar's video offers a lot more because it provides additional stimulus for the shoulders and lats, as well as rotational training for the spine. And you know, based on his reaction to the video that Emmanuel Scari posted. And I just want to note here that Emmanuel is an extremely impressive athlete, great combination of brute strength and mobility and visual size. I mean, he combines those about as well as anyone. He's also an extremely well-educated, um, humble athlete, very impressive person. But anyway, yeah, I, NH didn't seem to see the value of the side press, but I'll vouch for it. I think the side pressing is underrated for shoulder development since we hardly ever use that plane of motion anymore. I think I think it can help to target the side delts with an actual press a little bit more than we see in the, you know, conventional pressing variations. But anyway, I'll leave that at that. That's a that's a topic for another video. Anyway, whether you use conventional side bends or old school overhead movements, bending and twisting through the side is extremely good for your back health and compensating for all the movement that we do in the sagittal plane. And it's an excellent addition to your hypertrophy routine. So I think the simple addition of these five movement types would significantly enhance the functionality of modern hypertrophy programs, which typically leave them out. Even if you're still doing iliac rows or Smith Machine J Impress or whatever, I don't think anyone who isn't a DYEL cultist would say your training isn't ridiculously functional once you throw them in. Now, that's not to say the pro that the program would not have been functional before. Building muscle is almost always going to be functional as long as you aren't using a ton of drugs to build more muscle than you can safely use. But there are definitely greater and lesser degrees, right? It's on a continuum. These movements lead to a better range for the muscles that you do build to work through, better joints for them to work via, and in some cases just more muscle period, and all of these are more functional, so it's higher on the continuum, right? As a final bonus suggestion for making modern bodybuilding routines more functional, I'd recommend using the cut, like your calorie deficit period, as something of an off-season from dedicated hypertrophy training. Muscle loss on cuts is mostly a myth, provided that you aren't cutting to like striated glutes levels of single digit body fat conditioning. So you don't have to stick to the same kind of full on hypertrophy routine that you'd use to put on muscle during a surplus. The cut is an excellent time to make room in your program for work that isn't hypertrophy specific. While a lot of work for mobility and joint health can double as hypertrophy work, some can't. So the cut is an excellent time to do more in-depth and time consuming work on improving the health of a problematic joint or increasing a limited range of motion. On the opposite end of the spectrum can also be used to do heavier strength work that might not be the most optimal way to take advantage of a calorie surplus for muscle growth, but can increase your ability to use the muscle that you have more effectively. 
Or you could use that time to learn new exercises, maybe something outside your current wheelhouse, like you know calisthenics or something. Uh, that would take way too much skill practice to implement immediately into a bulking program and expect muscular gains, but could down the line lead to either muscular gains, increased ability to use those gains in a variety of situations, or both. Now, here's a hint, by the way, I mentioned uh, assist squats earlier. The cut would be the perfect time to practice them, acclimate to them, so you have time to gradually acclimate without the pressure to make them something that immediately produces muscular gains, right? Anyway, taking advantage of the final tip would require getting out of the mindset of, I only care about hypertrophy, I don't care about anything else, right? Not caring about, or even mostly about hypertrophy is bad. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad at all, right? I think it's a good thing if you had to pick between being jacked and stiff or DYL and mobile with good joints, I'd probably still say to be jacked, but you don't. It's so simple to make hypertrophy training even more valuable and functional. There's just a little bit of consideration for other training modalities that I'd like to see more people start to pick up these low-hanging fruits. You know, I get that for a while there was this need to defend against the influence of the dreaded power builders, but I think it's okay to allow a little bit of open-mindedness and curiosity about exercises outside the current zeitgeist of what's considered to be hypertrophy training. You know, we can we can let a little bit of that back in. You won't immediately become a DYL mobility guru or a strength coping power builder. And you might end up with better joints, better capabilities, and even visible gains, you know. All right, hope you guys found this video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, make sure to let the you know, computer stuff know by liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. All right, thank you guys. Later.